Singapore is running out of space. Space to develop and prosper. There are more developments now. It's harder to find land. Now, the little red dot is being re-engineered for the 21st century. Nobody has done it before. This is the only job that allows you to work on a smart city project in Singapore. We are going from about 350 megawatts of solar to uh, 2 gigawatts of solar, and that's a huge jump. New mega projects using state-of-the-art technologies to dig deep. I did not believe the space-saving part until I saw it with my own eyes. This is what engineering is all about. Uh. Automated ports. I can't imagine. Uh, we will be developing a 60-plus berth. And harness the power of the sun. It's a kind of new for Singapore to have solar panels on water. This is a journey into Singapore's Tomorrow City. Tenge Reservoir is usually a place of quiet contemplation. Now, the peace has been shattered by the sounds of construction. Work has started on a floating farm of solar panels. No one has ever built such an ambitious project in Singapore before. And the site engineers have to solve new technical challenges every day. Okay, okay, slow down, slow down. Reverse, reverse. No, 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 cannot. You, you need to pull the panel post. Kalamatu Chandarakuma, the engineer in charge of operations, is struggling to get the floating pontoon positioned correctly on the reservoir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you go there, I use the hook to push. Each pontoon has to be anchored to the bottom of the reservoir, and the team has run into problems finding the anchor points. I need to go. Uh. Ten artificial islands will be built here, made from 122,000 solar panels, covering an area the size of 45 football fields. The new solar farm will have the capacity to power 16,000 HDB flats for a year. The power from the Tengye project is equivalent to about 7% of QB's current energy demand. The energy generated will be used to offset the vast amount of power needed for Singapore's water supply. Getting clean, potable water for a population of nearly 6 million people and extensive industrial usage is a highly complex process. Rainwater collected in reservoirs is pumped into a network of treatment works. It passes through a series of purification operations to remove sediment and contaminants before it is stored and ready for distribution. CCK can treat uh, about 80 MGD, 18 million gallons of water per day, okay? and it's equivalent to about 145 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Okay? And, and it supplies clean water to the western region of Singapore. Water from the reservoirs in the western catchment, including Tenge, flows into Choa Chukang waterworks. Here, the water is mixed and treated. It's an energy-intensive process, and to lower the energy footprint, the PUB is investing in new technologies. Basically, CCK, we have uh, two phases of our treatment processes. Phase one was built in 1975, and phase two was built later in 1981. So in 2019, we upgraded from sand filtration system to uh, ceramic membrane system. Ceramic membranes play a vital role in the purification process. They are essentially filters that remove contaminants from rainwater. Because ceramic membranes are more efficient than other materials, 
they help reduce the energy used by the plant. And Singapore holds a world first for this at Choa Chu Kang Waterworks. One of the best things about ceramic membrane is that it is the largest ceramic membrane plant in the world in a single plant. Choa Chu Kang Waterworks is one of the most advanced treatment plants in Singapore. But even this state-of-the-art plant still requires huge amounts of energy. So the question is, how can Singapore generate all that power needed in a more sustainable way? If we continue business as usual, I expect it to quadruple close to 2060 with the doubling of the water demand. Hence, renewables provide a very important opportunity for us to lower our carbon footprint and produce water cleaner. According to the Public Utilities Board, or PUB, the solution is in the sun. Solar energy is one of the most viable renewable sources in Singapore. So for us, we're interested in both rooftop land and floating solar. But the big problem is that renewable energy sources, whether wind or solar, need space. Lots of space. Wind farms and solar projects occupy huge areas of land or sea to effectively compete with non-renewable energy systems. But space is a resource Singapore is running short of. Solar deployment is dependent on the availability of land. So our large reservoir surfaces does provide a very good opportunity for us to deploy large-scale flowing solar farms. So now um, PUB's reservoirs can double up as stormwater catchment areas, as well as um, hosts for large floating solar farms. So the planners decided to kill two birds with one stone. This ambitious plan has been piloted for Tenge. It's a clever idea because until now, reservoirs have only been used to catch and store water. Rain that falls on Singapore's 728 square kilometers of land is channeled to 17 reservoirs. These reservoirs are an untapped resource. At Tenge, the engineers begin constructing access routes to the reservoir. These will be needed during construction to bring in the panels, cables, and other components of the new solar farm. Now we are at the preparation stage. We preparation of the temporary access roads and ramps. And the next one, erecting the platforms and the ramps on the onshore to the reservoir. So it's a meeting point of the water and the land. At Tenge, there will be 10 zones of floating solar cells joined together in rafts or pontoons. Each cell uses a double glass construction to amplify the durability. When sunlight hits the solar panels, the absorbed radiation triggers a reaction that generates an electrical current and heat. One of the advantages of constructing the solar farm on the reservoir is that there is abundant wind to cool the panels. The solar panels send a flow of direct current to combiner boxes, which convert it into alternating or AC current for domestic and industrial use. From the plant, the AC current is sent into the national grid. Tenge looks set to be one of the world's biggest island solar farms. It is expected to offset an estimated 32 kilotons of carbon emissions yearly, which is equivalent to removing 7,000 cars from the island's roads. But what will the vast new solar farm mean for the natural environment of the reservoir? Singapore's water catchment areas were built long ago and have since become homes to unique wildlife, even welcoming back previously endangered species. The PUB is obligated to protect these habitats. So a specialist team has been tasked with monitoring the impact of the solar farm construction. So we're going to collect the data from here, right? Yeah. Okay. Environmental consultant Hong Yo will be keeping a very close eye on the flora and fauna at the reservoir to ensure that there is no disruption to their environment. His team will use a network of these camera traps to record the numbers and activities of animals during construction. 
We don't want to disturb the animals surrounding here. That's the purpose of this survey. You will see common birds like minas, or kingfishers, or even like the, the raptors you can see at the background, the brahmini kites. And then uh, on, a, on one instance, we saw a monkey, a long-tailed macaque. Hong Yao's work has long-term significance. The PUB wants to use the island's other reservoirs to build more solar farms. So Tenge will need a clean bill of environmental health for other projects of this scale to get the green light. Helming the project at Tenge is energy and urban development company, Semcorp. The company's solar division has a lot of experience installing rooftop solar panels, but the reservoir is a first for its young team. The difference between a ground-mounted system or a rooftop system compared to a floating PV system is that it is a static system. But for your floating PV system, it's always in movement due to the environmental conditions such as the water speed, the wind speed, wave movements. So there is an additional set of uh, consideration that we need to put in in order to make sure that the system is stable and it can operate for 25 years. Engineer Yun Fun contributed to the technical design of the floating farm and he's come to the site to check progress. How many panels do we have? Yeah, as for construction status, mm. right now we have four ramps mm. and we will be assembling them in an assembly line. Mm. So, um, as you can see from that side, um, they will be assembling the PV panels, mm. they will be putting them on floats, mm. then they will start to place them all over here. The SEMCORP engineers had to come up with innovative ways to ensure that the panels could withstand the unpredictable conditions on the reservoir but they've run into quite a few problems putting these into practice. There's some teething issues we have sorted out. Yeah, so right now, actually, the floating frame and everything, right, is a bit more complicated compared to the other rooftop installations that we have. So that is uh, one thing that is like, slowing down production. This is the first attempt at constructing a solar farm of this scale in Singapore, in an unpredictable environment. Every panel must cope with factors such as wind, water quality and wildlife that might come into contact. The panels are constructed on shore, then pieced together like a huge jigsaw puzzle on the ramp to form the floating pontoons. The pontoons are made from high-density polyethylene to ensure that the water quality isn't affected. Each pontoon will then be towed to its position on the reservoir and tethered by anchors attached to the bottom. For the engineers, the learning curve is a steep one. On site, the first challenge is to assemble the multi-layered solar panels. You must handling one more person means you ask one more supervisor to arrange one more supervisor, one more worker. Okay? Don't take shortcut when you do manual handling. Ah, this the right method. The workers have been assembling the parts in pairs, but these panels are delicate, and even minor damage during installation can cause an issue down the line. If they're not carried properly, the metal parts over here can damage the glass over below the PV panels. So an extra pair of hands is needed. Let's say now, no problem, maybe install in the reservoir itself, right? Very difficult to identify which panel is cracked or maybe which string is cracked. There will be a lot of manpower wastage. And replacing in the reservoir, mean the panels in the reservoir more higher risk than this means doing the work in the ground itself. While Ashok sorts out the assembly line, Eugene checks the cabling that connects the different parts of the pontoon. Only when all the checks are completed can the floats be towed into the reservoir. Why, why this cable is not connected a lot? Yeah. Okay, this, this cable we uh, connect to the other, other panel, mm. then follow up by the string. Each of the solar panels must be earthed and then connected to the other panels. The cabling is so intricate that one mistake can compromise the entire system. Today, 
Eugene has to make a few corrections. So we found one of the earthing cables, the yellow color cable. It was torn from the connection due to a very high tension. So issues like cable management, cables, uh, especially like uh, the fasteners for the floats, any issues with them have to be resolved uh, before uh, actually towing the array out because uh, they will actually save time. Now how we are doing, mm. now we uh, push the panel, mm. then fix this board. Okay. Then after fix also, still we need to work there mm. and try the cable tight. Okay. Yeah. This is the uh, difficulty. Okay. Like, so have you all tried uh, removing the cable uh, over there? Like, uh, let's say, like, that's between the panels itself? Okay. Actually, now, now, uh, now the gap what? is very short. <laughs> Understand. <laughs> because, uh, Okay. Once the artificial islands are afloat, the cables will be under continuous stress due to the water currents. Over time, the solar panels will need to be repaired or even replaced, and the SEMCORP engineers are still figuring out how to do that on a floating island. So right now, right, it's very much in the experimental phase. Let's say for our rooftop installations, uh, it's actually elevated. So if you want to change a panel, right, go underneath the panel, and then you just like lift it up from the other side. But from here, right, let's say if you want to uh, change the PV panels in the middle, there's actually very little room for you to maneuver. On the reservoir, the team has run into difficulties attaching the pontoon to the sinkers that will anchor it to the bottom. You free. We need to disconnect each boy's wire. Chandira is the engineer in charge of the operation. We need to disconnect. La. So we... Maybe we go to other corner, that side. The jungle side corner. Huh? Then we need to disconnect from the panel. Technical difficulties are not the only problems confronting the engineers. When COVID-19 hit Singapore in 2020, the number of workers was cut down. Now, they are trying to make up for lost time. If they can't get this first solar island into position on time, the project could fall behind schedule. They have just six more months to complete it. Tucked away on the western fringes of Singapore, SEMCORP engineers are building a huge solar energy project on the once calm waters of Tenge Reservoir. Today, the first floating solar island or pontoon is ready to be towed out to its final location. But Chandira, the engineer helming the operation, has run into some difficulties. No, 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 cannot. You, you need to pull the Panel post. Pull this one already. This one comes some more. That one too far. La. Okay, you go there, I use the hook to pull. Go to the boy, huh? the first boy. Huh? Yeah, yeah. The team has towed the pontoon to its position on the reservoir. Now they have to locate the submerged sinkers. Then, they have to match the right sinker to specific anchor points on the floating island. OK, go to the next one, next one. OK, go to another one. Strong winds are threatening to push the pontoon in the wrong direction. It's become a test of the boatman's skills. Okay, okay, okay. Come on, tie, tie now. After a difficult hour battling the winds, the job is finally done.
For Singapore, the future well-being and security of the city-state hinges on the success of projects like the Tenge Solar Farm. Tenge Reservoir is just one example of the way Singapore is tackling the problems of global warming and space shortage at the same time. A new initiative called Cooling Singapore is taking a different tack by studying how warming has an impact at street level. Hello, we are conducting a survey. How do you feel right now? Cold, cool, slightly cool, neutral, slightly warm, warm or hot? How do you feel about the humidity now? Very dry, dry, neutral, humid or very humid? Humid. As an island situated close to the equator, Singapore is uniquely vulnerable to sea level change and global warming. A study conducted in 2018 revealed that at certain times of the day, urban areas in Singapore were 7 degrees Celsius hotter than forested zones. This is called the urban heat island effect. If you look at temperatures downtown in Orchard Road, it was 30 degrees Celsius at 10 p.m. Uh, and in Lim Chu Kang, it was 23 degrees Celsius. We know what causes the heat island. You know, it's established science. We know what causes climate change. It's also established science. The challenge, though, is trying to develop a set, a basket, a combination of solutions that can give us the best outcomes to reduce our exposure to both the heat island and to climate change. Cooling Singapore was launched in 2017 to look into the challenges of a warming island. Today, they are trying to investigate outdoor thermal comfort. Basically, how hot do you feel? Outdoor thermal comfort is how a person perceives, feels and responds to uh, his, her, their exposure to the outdoor environment through temperature, humidity, wind speed, and exposure to sun. Over a period of seven months, researchers collected data from monitoring stations in Singapore's central business district, and they sent other teams to install sensors in areas with tree cover, like Bishan Park. We are mounting some sensors to measure what is the performance of different trees uh, regarding thermal comfort. We want to know how different species, how different, different shapes of trees can impact on the thermal comfort. So we will be mounting five sets of sensors, one of each below a uh, tree. We deployed four sensors and we saw significant differences in the thermal comfort just because it was under a tree or beside a high-rise building. The high-rise building was producing some shadow in the afternoon and the drop and the benefit in thermal comfort was clearly seen. You can, we, we can see this in the, in the graph. Cooling Singapore looks at how small-scale improvements in urban design can help to mitigate the effects of warming. But that's not enough. What's key is the usage of renewable energies to reduce the dependence on traditional sources, like gas and oil, which produce emissions that cause global warming. We know that Singapore's energy source, 95% um, of it comes from natural gas. The aim is eventually, uh, as we reach uh, the middle of this century, we want to get as much renewable energy sources in. So why wait until 2050? The urgency required you know, for the climate change problem and for the heat island problem is to make sure your electrical appliances, the, the sort of things that we use to cool the environment mechanically, like air conditioning, we want to use renewable energy. OK, hi, guys. Uh, I just wanted to quickly check on uh, the floating solar test bed which we have in Tengia Reservoir. While the PUB and SEMCORP are testing out their potentially revolutionary floating solar farm idea, at the other end of the island, the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore, or CERIS, is going at it from a different angle. Their project is all to do with clouds, for clouds have a huge impact on solar farms. 
solar radiation in Singapore rises and falls as cloud cover changes. This means that the power generated by the farms is not consistent and weather conditions can sometimes cause black or brownouts. The scientists at Ceres are developing a way of mapping the changing cloud cover to predict just how much power solar farms in Singapore can potentially generate. It's called solar forecasting, and this will become increasingly essential as the PUB boosts its investments in solar energy. So this shows you at any given point in time how much is the sun intensity that comes down onto Singapore. And this is a, an interpolation of 25 different stations which we have deployed all uh, across Singapore, which you can see here on the map. So all these yellow dots are installations uh, in, of irradiance measurements uh, equipment, which is interconnected through our proprietary real-time monitoring system and then collect it here in this room in order to generate the uh, live irradiance map. This live irradiance map will prove most useful to the team at Tenge Reservoir. So, so these are additional information which we need in order to do solar forecasting. So we have uh, satellite images in order to track the clouds, how they move, but we also have uh, so-called sky cameras so we try to predict the movement of clouds because every cloud will uh, inherently impact the, uh, the power output of a solar installation. And we try to look at the clouds from below with so-called sky cameras. And we look to, uh, on clouds from atop, which is then satellite pictures, and try to match these and then try to predict how the clouds are moving because then eventually this will tell us which solar systems will see shade in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes or the next hour or longer. And then we can project what will be the output of solar power systems installed in Singapore. The solar panels at Tenge use silicon to convert light energy into electricity. A silicon panel converts between 17 and 19% of light into power. What if this conversion rate could be boosted? And if so, can this efficiency boost reduce the pressure on the amount of land space needed to build solar projects? So the crystalline silicon solar cells, they've been around for many decades. They're well understood and that's why the industry has adopted it to a degree that virtually all the solar panels today are made of crystalline silicon. So now the major aim is to increase the efficiencies. Today's uh, crystalline silicon solar cells can go up to 25% uh, in industrial production. And we are trying to push these limits to go to 26, 27. Uh, ultimate aim is to go beyond 30%. Now, there is a new technology that promises to make solar energy more efficient. And it lies in a tiny mineral called perovskite. It has a crystal structure that absorbs sunlight more efficiently than silicon. In Singapore, researchers have been astonished by its performance in the lab. When we tried it out, the efficiency was already much higher than what we had done before. So although uh, I did not want to believe in it, I have no choice because data is king and I got to believe it. It's much easier to make, it just works. At the School of Material Science and Engineering at Nanyang Technological University, Professor Nripan Matthews and his team are hard at work investigating the potential of perovskite. And here are some demonstrators. Uh, Damon, could you help me? So this is uh, one of the slot I quoted modules. You can use it to power lighting, of course. You can um, use it to power, what else? Uh, simple uh, internal uh, clocks, etc. The advantage of perovskite solar cells is that the materials that we use, the quantity of materials that we use is much, much lesser. So you can make lighter, flexible solar cells. The amount of material that you need to make is not that high. Perovskite may well be a game changer in solar energy. Because the material is more efficient, solar projects like the one at Tenge will not need so much space. Perovskite can be used in panels thinner than a human hair, and these panels can be made using inkjet printers. It's simple and cheap, in theory. So uh, let's walk through the labs. 
So um, our lab has um, many kinds of chemical assembly, chemical analysis, um, etc. So over here is a room we do a lot of our printing. So you can come in. So this is our large format printer, uh, which can go 30 cm by 30 cm. And uh, we use the same screen printing technology. Uh, so these are the different precursors that we use. As you can see, all of them are solution. Uh, viscous space. So we print them layer by layer, and then we infiltrate the perovskites through them. Professor Nripan is passionate about perovskite. Now, he just has to find a way to perfect the production. In land-scarce Singapore, scientists and engineers are working out ways to maximize the nation's solar output to help mitigate climate change. The key is to make ever more efficient use of space and technology. The mineral perovskite promises to maximize the efficiency of solar energy technology and replace aging silicon panels. Startup Prominence PV is the first company in Singapore trying to manufacture perovskite glass panels. How we carry and then move this at the same time. Once, uh, once we fit it in, right, then we just one person push one side only. Oh, the main thing is to get it onto the frame. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I get the, uh, I get this two aga aga in place, slot it in ready, then we move. Okay, I just go to make it go up. Yeah. Okay, okay. Like, so we are not moving as fast as we would like. Because, uh, of uh, equipment issues and uh, supply issues. Uh, but I think we, are, we have still made a lot of progress considering that we are building something from scratch and, and all these things are new. It's not, something, it's not uh, uh, something that we can get elsewhere. So we are, we are, and most of the machines we are in uncharted territories. So that, I think in terms of progress, we, we have done a lot, uh, but we still like to be faster. Gan and his team are in the midst of designing the manufacturing process from scratch. And as with all experiments, there are plenty of teething problems. Okay, is it in? Okay. Yeah, in, in. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope for the best, man. Okay. Finally, the machine is ready for its first test run. The other side is a little bit too high, so the ink is not spreading properly. Yeah, I need to do some fine tuning. Too high, ah? A little bit too high. You tell me what to do, lah. Huh? No, I just want to do. I do. Okay, lah. I think should be okay. Then I just need to pour more paste. Okay, lah. Just uh, press the one print, and then it should be okay. Okay. Now one more time. Yeah. Okay. Actually, the print is looking pretty good. Yeah. Wait, uh, we will move it out slowly. Uh. Yeah. A lot of dust. You can see the little specks. It's like, like little protrusions. Yeah. yeah. All so, those are dust, uh, which is why we need to be clean. Later, we'll be doing a major, major cleanup. <laughs> so once because now, we just have to make sure the machines are running first. This is a dummy print. I'm 80% to 90% satisfied. So the rest of... So uh, at least this machine, we know that it's working. Now it's up to us to really clean it up and make sure that during the actual printing, we don't get this kind of dust. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite happy that uh, for first run, I think it's a pretty good result. But uh, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Ensuring that the screen printing machine works is the crux of the process. With their first test print a success, they are one step closer. But there are still many obstacles to overcome in order to scale up the production. 
This will require months to fix. At Tenge Reservoir, the tricky process of anchoring the floating islands has finally been completed. They have installed nine out of 10 islands. It has taken them eight months of assembling and tweaking the connections. Now the team can start testing the panels on one of the islands. Like any electrical system, everything depends on getting the connections right. So uh, what we did, well, what we wanted to do was just to see if the panels are connected and working efficiently, are working properly. Eugene will test the panels row by row with a voltmeter to ensure that they are all properly connected. If there is no reading, it means that there's a breakage in the wiring, and he will have to recheck every single panel to identify the problem. The earthing cable requires special attention. This needs to be properly grounded. If it isn't, the entire system could be tripped. Like any electrical engineer, Eugene dreads finding a loose connection between the panels. And now, he has. Okay, so for this zone 10, right, initially, uh, it was sort of like a trial. So I think they didn't tighten the uh, ground cable, the nut, tight enough. So maybe by the time it came to here, some of the wires became slightly looser, and then there's a break in continuity. Not a good electrical contact. It's been a frustrating day, but finally, the system is properly connected, and Eugene is satisfied that every link in the chain is secure. OK. Everything is all right. OK, thank you. Eugene knows that keeping an eye on all those tricky connections in the future will require a new approach. He's going to need an eye in the sky. We can use some of the more emerging technologies like drone, using drones to help make the maintenance efforts more effective and more efficient. Today, this new drone technology is being trialled at Tenge. The drone is equipped with specially designed cameras. The engineer in charge is Yong Sheng, and he has to test the new drone before it takes off on its maiden flight. So we are going to do a full-site drone electroluminescence inspection of these uh, floating PV plants. So in total, we are going to capture 120,000 over solar panels of the EL images. And the idea is we want to see whether there's any problem with the solar panels. Can I just check what kind of drone will be flying? I'm flying uh, Foxpack Gaia 160S. Solar farm companies typically use infrared images taken by inspectors on the ground to check for defective solar cells. This new electroluminescence test can survey the entire array of panels to reveal any malfunctioning parts in the system. Electroluminescence you can think of it, solar panel in the daytime, you have uh, sunlight, so it will convert the sunlight into electricity. So similarly, the solar cells, you can function the other way around by injecting a current to the cells, and then it will emit a uh, light. But this light is in a very specific wavelength where it is not detectable by our human eye. So you need to use a special camera to detect this electroluminescent signal. OK, so thanks, guys. Uh, are we good to go? Uh, yes. We can proceed to the water. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay. Let's go. I am quite excited to conduct the test because this is the first time EL is being done on an installed location. I'm actually quite curious as well to see if there is uh, anything that we can do to improve on our working process. Even though we designed these plants to run for like uh, decades, most of our plants are quite new. The drone test is a success. 
Now, the Semcorp engineers have one last island to complete before the farm can be officially opened. As Singapore continues to grow economically, so do our energy demands. With challenges brought about by climate change, Singapore has chosen to invest heavily in clean energy. The goal for 2030 is to be able to deploy at least two gigawatt peak of solar energy. This can power up to 350,000 households. With this concrete deadline, the work at Tenge Reservoir continues. But ambitious new projects like Tenge can only be one part of the solution. Reinventing how Singapore generates power in the 21st century requires new thinking across the grid, literally. Today, most of Singapore's power is generated by burning liquefied natural gas. This is converted into electrical power and transmitted to the national grid. Then, the electricity is distributed to consumers. It's a one-way process. Professor Subud Maisalkar, Executive Director of the Energy Research Institute at the Nanyang Technological University, believes that Singapore needs to rethink the power grid and how it is used. Solar electricity is not being generated if the sun is not shining. So for the intermittency part, we need energy storage. Our power grid needs to be modernized. We need to digitalize the power grid. We need to introduce new technologies like power semiconductors uh, into the grid. So the, so the new smart grid of the future would enable peer-to-peer -peer trading. So the consumer now is fully empowered to generate electricity and sell electricity back either to the grid or to its neighbors or to its peers. Certain startups are doing just that. They are taking the initiative to revolutionize Singapore's grid. One of them is Electrify. Hey. Hi, Hi, how are you? Hi, see you. Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. Hey, we'll check out the meter as well. CEO Martin Lim feels that the national grid should be open to anyone who can provide power especially ordinary Singaporeans who are generating solar energy on their own. Okay, so here are our solar panels. Nice. Um, okay, so here's a better view of the solar panels. Yeah, it's very You can see the 10 by 10 uh, solar panels. Um, so this is a 6.3 kilowatt peak system. So on average, about three and a half sun hours, we get about 21 kilowatt hours of uh, energy per day. An air conditioning unit uses around 3.5 kilowatts per hour. Robin's 21 kilowatts are sufficient to power his air conditioner for up to six hours a day. He spent around 14,000 US dollars on the installation of the solar panels and is now trying to recoup his initial investment. He is selling the total generated 90 kilowatts per month to interested consumers through Electrify's platform. So the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform, we called it uh, SolarShare, allows end users to be able to trade the surplus solar energy that they have across a citywide grid to anyone else who wants to consume it. So any surplus power from this rooftop generation will be sold back through the grid to anyone else on the grid who wants to buy that power. SolarShare is the first peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform in Southeast Asia, launched in collaboration with companies Senoko Energy and NG Factory. Connected, yes! So this sensor will read the current running through the trunking. So what we've got to do is we have to scan it until the light turns green, tells us the strong signal strength, and we find an appropriate position and we stick it on. You just see it's scanning, oh, yeah. it's green already. Immediate, yeah. So this sensor will pull the data uh, from this conduit over here. Mm. It will send the current data over to the base station that we installed just now. Right. So that unit will transmit this energy data back to us. So this has current, 
that one will read voltage and then on the back end we'll match the two together to determine the energy flow. And that's how we do it. It looks pretty easy and straightforward. It's green. So Devices like this help to track the amount of surplus energy generated and sold on the grid. The amount that Robin earns per month is enough to offset his air conditioning bills. If you generate a surplus power, for example, you sell the power back to the wholesale market in this case. Being able to generate that power is important. So if you had the ability to generate and could store that power and use it, that's fantastic. It, it accelerates the green agenda, right? And if you're able to export that surplus to other people who need it, that's even better. Climate change is a clear and present danger especially for low-lying island states. So Singapore has put in place the 2030 Green Plan, a national sustainability movement which aims to rally collective action in all sectors to tackle climate change. One of the pillars is the investment in renewable energies and its related tech innovations. But new technologies need space, and Singapore is just a small island. More groundbreaking solutions will be required in the coming decades to tackle climate change. Like the Tenge Reservoir Solar Project. The new solar farm was completed on time in July 2021. Now, the thousands of floating solar panels are sending power to Singapore's water treatment plants. In our Tomorrow City.